right, great. So I'm going to be talking about pseudorandom generators for small space uh, via Fourier analysis. And this is uh, based on some joint work with Omer Reingold, Salil Vedan, and Andrew Wan. So I'm sure pseudorandom generators need no introduction to this audience, but nonetheless, the, the, you know, the task of a pseudorandom generator is to take a small seed, ideally of length log n, and stretch it to something uh, of length n. And uh, this should be indistinguishable from being truly uniform to all efficient computations, or some class that we have to specify that we want to form. <coughs> now, one particular goal that we might have for uh, constructing pseudorandom generators is derandomization. So that means taking randomized algorithms and turning them into deterministic algorithms without destroying the efficiency. Now, uh, if you look at the landscape of this, there's uh, this pie in the sky uh, goal of uh, derandomizing BPP. That's something that we think is a little bit uh, out of reach at the moment. But something that's sort of closer to the horizon is derandomizing a set of polynomial time logarithmic space. And the reason we think that is approachable is that we already know how to uh, derandomize logarithmic space computations into log to the 1.5 space. And we also have this uh, wonderful derandomization of uh, undirected ST connectivity. These are things you already have. So let's talk about derandomizing log space. So to uh, do this, it would suffice to have a pseudorandom generator that itself runs in logarithmic space. Uh, this is uh, indistinguishable from uniform for all log space distinguishes and has logarithmic seed length. So those are the three requirements. And uh, the best we have, unfortunately, is log squared seed length, which is enough to show that you have uh, log to the log squared deterministic space. We also have some other derandomization results which aren't strictly uh, pseudorandom generator derandomizations. Uh, the first is uh, a log to the 1.5 uh, space derandomization by Sachs and Zhou. And we also have underrated AC connectivity in uh, log space, and that's a result by uh, Omer Angle. So after over two decades, we still really don't have any improvement in terms of uh, pseudorandom generators for uh, log space, except for a handful of special cases. So let me just sort of show you the cartoon of what Nissan's uh, approach is just in one slide. So basically, you look at your computation, you split it into a first half and a second half, and you say, well, look, the only sort of communication between these two is some S-bit state. Now suppose I feed n over two truly random bits to the first half of the computation, and now I'm sort of running low on randomness, so I wonder what I need to do. And then I look at this bit and I say, well, this still has a lot of entropy left because you know, there's only an S-bit state that has been remembered about this. And as a result, I can sort of recycle this, this randomness. Now this recycling is gonna be something like an extractor, a universal hash function, or uh, an expander uh, graph. And you need a little bit of auxiliary uh, randomness to make this work. Okay, great. So, you know, applying this recursively is what gets you this uh, log squared C length. So this approach has been sort of the basis of decades of, of, of work, but somehow it doesn't seem like we're gonna get past this log squared <laughs> barrier in the general case, because somehow we'd have to either Get, avoid doing the recursion or get away with a constant amount of randomness at each step of the recursion. So it sort of seems like we're a little bit stuck here and we sort of want to bring in some new techniques. So one place uh, that we might want to look for techniques is uh, Fourier analysis. So there have been, there's been a lot of success in building pseudorandom generators that, you know, their analysis is built on uh, Fourier analysis and this has been successful for other classes of distinguishers, not, not for small space necessarily, but for, uh, for other things. So let me give you some examples. This is a very incomplete list. So we know that for uh, space one bit, we uh, can actually get logarithmic seed length, and that's using small, uh, small bias distributions, which are a very nice uh, tool. We also know how to fool uh, GF2 polynomials using uh, the sum of small bias distributions. That's something that uh, Raghu spoke about at the opening uh, workshop. 
and that gets you, you know, a logarithmic seed length plus some, some large uh, term in terms of the degree. We also know that uh, half spaces can be fooled by k-wise independence. And uh, similarly, we can get uh, AC0 circuits being fooled by k-wise independence. Now, these are not uh, the, the best known results. We can, we can do better than this. But I just wanted to give you some, some examples of the success of using free analytic techniques to construct pseudorandom generators. OK, so what I'm going to be talking about today is trying to construct pseudorandom generators for small space uh, using techniques from Fourier analysis. Now, uh, there's, there's some other work that I'm not going to be talking about, but basically that's the, the thing I want to push on, is that you know, one source of new ideas to, to help us develop pseudorandom generators for small space is the, the work in uh, Fourier, analytic, Fourier analysis based pseudorandom generators. So for the rest of the talk, I'm going to start by introducing the computational model, which is read once branching programs. So this is a, a model that sort of captures small space, but is also non-uniform to make it uh, a little more interesting. And then I'm going to just uh, briefly talk about free analysis and how uh, we can use that to sort of measure the complexity of functions. And then I'll tell you about the, uh, the pseudorandom generator that uh, I'm, I'm particular, I've been looking at. So let's talk about uh, branching programs as a model of computation. So if I tell you small space, and I really think about extremely small space, so constant space, you're going to think, hey, I'm going to use uh, a finite automaton. But this is sort of like a uniform model of computation. You've got one thing that doesn't change depending on the input length. So a branching program is just a non-uniform version of this. So think of it as saying that the transition function changes at each step. So we think of this now as some sort of uh, uh, acyclic graph, and if you get an input, that's going to basically tell you how to walk through this graph. So you start at some start node, and then you just follow the, the edges based on the labels given to you in your input, and then you'll either end up in an accept node or a reject node. It's a reasonably, uh, it's a reasonably clean model of computation. And you know you can get different, different inputs that will uh, lead you to, to different outcomes. And if you sit down, this example that I've put up here is computing the following uh, DNF. Okay, so just uh, some, some terms. The length, which we'll denote n, is just the number of bits that this thing reads. The width is the number of states that you have. So it's 2 to the amount of space. That's how you should think of it. And, and one distinction I also want to make is between ordered and unordered branching programs. So an ordered branching program reads the bits in the order that they're presented, so bit one, bit two, bit three, whereas an unordered branching program gets to choose how it reads the bits. But we're going to stick to read once branching programs, which means that each bit is only going to be read once. OK, great. So I'm sure many of you are quite familiar with Fourier analysis, but Yes. In the uh, unordered case, when the computer gets to choose how many bits, that's still decided in advance. It's not like it's decided in advance. Yes. Advance. So it's not a like a dynamic thing where it gets to choose how to read. All right. So free analysis, it's. But your PRG does not know the order. Yes. Otherwise, you know, you could just. You know, do whatever you want. Um. Uh, so Fourier analysis is this magical unitary transformation that just says take some function represented in the basis of parity functions, and you know somehow these coefficients, these Fourier coefficients, are, are going to be really useful, and it's it's kind of magical to be honest. So one way that we can use uh, you know the Fourier transform is to sort of measure the complexity of a function. So one simple measure is the Fourier mass of a function. So we just take the L1 norm of all of the Fourier coefficients. And that's going to give you some notion of the complexity of the function. Now, what's really nice is that if this is small, then we have pseudorandom generators for it, now, very clean pseudorandom generators, uh, which is the small bias generator. So I'm going to be talking about a more uh, refined notion of uh, complexity, which I'm going to call Fourier growth. So what you do is you look not at the whole 
Fourier spectrum, but you just look at a certain level of the hypercube, you look at uh, the L1 norm of all the Fourier coefficients at that level. So this is gonna give you a more refined measure of the complexity of function. In particular, we're gonna look at how this grows with K. And we're gonna look at bounds of the form, you know, you start with some sort of base A and then you have an exponential growth B uh, with K. Yes? That's essentially the same as looking at a noisy version, a function right. where you're applying it to noisy inputs. Exactly, yeah. So another way you could sort of measure this is to say I'm going to sort of you know, sum up all the free coverages, we're going to multiply them by some you know, beta to the power of the size of s as a sort of damped version of that, yeah. Um, yes? Doesn't that give you the L2 for a mask at various levels? Does it? I think so. Uh, I mean, I mean, the, the damn thing, I guess, will just damn the 4A like one. But if you, you do the, the like if you do the like noise operator, that's just going to multiply all the coefficients by some some damping factor. And if you look at the L1 norm of the the noised function, that's this. It's equivalent to this. Okay. So now you know the question is, does this actually correspond to a pseudorandom generator? And the answer is uh, sometimes, or well, yes. So let's assume we have some class of functions, and you know we have to assume these are computed by polynomial width branching programs, and that this class is closed under restriction. So if I set one of the bits of the function, it's still going to be in the class. And suppose I have some nice uh, free growth bound for all of the uh, functions in this class. Then there is actually then there is going to be a pseudorandom generator with with the seed length. So the the seed length sort of depends linearly in, in B, which is the base of the growth of the, the Fourier mass, and then you get a log squared uh, n term. Yes. Non constructively, what would you expect? Like what what's the best you would hold in terms of uh, non constructively? Uh, I mean. Non-constructively, always we get log n for just about anything. Some of us have been large a and b are capturing all functions. So, could you could it, could it be polylogging a and b, or is that too much to ask? Um, so you notice that I have this assumption here that this class is of polynomial with branching programs, and that assumption is important. So, um, I don't. I don't know what to do if you remove those uh, assumptions. Okay, it's fully width and uh, So yeah, you have two assumptions about it. Uh, so now, you know, to make this theorem useful, we actually have to give some examples of classes of functions that have a uh, nice Fourier growth bounds. So to a couple of examples. So first of all, regular branching programs. Uh, now, I don't want to go into the details of what it means for a branching program to be regular, but basically it means that if you look at the, the, you know, the graph, it's a regular graph. We also know that for constant depth polynomial size circuits, so AC0, we have uh, bounds like this. And we also have this for arbitrary read once branching programs of width 3. So these are some interesting examples that sort of show that we have uh, bounds like this. So let me, let me give a little bit more detail about uh, this. So let's take a regular branching program. Then we get a free growth bound, which has this base just in terms of the, the width. And I think this is an interesting bound because it's independent of n. So somehow the free growth doesn't depend on the number of bits you read. And this gets you uh, a sort of a log squared seed length for uh, permutation branching programs, which is uh, nice. Uh, for uh, AC0, we get a logarithmic base, a polylogarithmic base, which means you get a, a, seed, a seed length of log to the, to the d plus 1. Um, but this is only for read once AC0, because, because of the assumption that you know, it has to be computed by a read once branching program, even though this, this Fourier growth bound holds for non read once AC0. And for uh, with 3, uh, we get 
also a logarithmic base plus some polynomial factor at the front that we don't uh, really care too much about, which also gives you a polylogarithmic seed length for uh, width three. Um, yes. For width four, it will break down because of in a product or something. Uh, my conjecture is that it still works for width four. It's just we don't have a proof. Like, uh, if you consider the inner product function, will it be computable in width four or with five, something like that? It's a bent function. So. Thought about that. Uh, we can maybe talk about it offline. I think it's a, that's an interesting question. Is it in the product with three? I don't think so. And it depends how exactly the bits are. Let's oh, yeah, sure. So where this is useful is that this applies to unordered right. programs. Right. Yeah. So that's that's a point I'll get to later. So one of the one of the, the nice uh, the nice facts about this is that it's sort of order oblivious. It doesn't matter if you permute the output bits of this pseudorandom generator; it's still going to have this property. Whereas Nissan's generator uh, doesn't have this property. It provably doesn't have this property. But I, I guess it's okay for I mean in a product even. I mean, all the Fourier coefficients are two to the minus n over two, so it's not a problem for this. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know the Fourier transform of inner product off the top of my head, so I'd have to think more about that example. Okay, so I want to tell you what the pseudorandom generator is that is uh, <laughs> underlying this. So let's take our computation. We think of it as reading in n bits. What we're going to do is we're going to pseudorandomly select a subset of those bits. And we're going to set them using a small bias uh, generator. So we select them in an almost k-wise independent manner, and we set them to values from a small bias distribution. OK, great. So maybe we've set 1% of the bits. Now we repeat. So we, again, select a sort of random subset of the bits set in an k almost k-wise independent manner, and then we set them using a small bias space. And, and we repeat this until we set all of the bits. That's basically how the, the generator works. Now this generator uh, was originally developed by uh, Gopalan, Mecca, Rangel, Travis, and Vadan. I hope I've remembered that correctly. And what they used it for is to develop nearly optimal uh, pseudorandom generators for read once CNFs. Um, and then you know, the, the later papers are just sort of a tweak on the underlying pseudorandom generator with a, a slightly different analysis. So what's the intuition for why this uh, pseudorandom generator might work? So let's start by looking at something I've already mentioned, which is using small bias generators uh, and using them for functions with low Fourier mass. So let's take a function with small Fourier mass, and we'll take some epsilon bias distribution. So what's an epsilon bias distribution? Well, if I look at uh, the expectation of sort of this inner product, and I sort of raise it you know, minus 1 to that to sort of normalize it, that's going to be between plus and minus epsilon. So we think of this as sort of being the Fourier coefficient of the distribution, and we say that these are small. Well, now all we do is we look at the expectation of this function under x, compare it to uniform, and this has a very nice expression in terms of the, the Fourier coefficients. And then you just apply you know, the triangle inequality, and you see that this is going to be the Fourier mass times the bias of your distribution. This is nice because we know how to sample uh, such a distribution with very low seed length. Okay, so that's the use of small bias spaces to handle functions with small Fourier mass. So what about uh, functions with uh, small Fourier growth? So one way you could do this is you could, you know, take a, so let's start with a function that has small Fourier growth, and we'll take a small bias distribution as, as before. But now we're going to take a, a noise distribution. So a noise distribution, I'm just going to say it's a, a product distribution, so independent bits, but those bits are going to be a little bit biased, beta biased. Now if you look at the Fourier coefficients of this uh, distribution, which is, um, again, we're looking at this, this inner product, these things are going to decay. So the larger the, the 
S, the smaller the, this expectation. So that's sort of going to you know, intuitively kill all the high order Fourier coefficients, whereas the small bias distribution kills all coefficients equally. So now if you run F on the XOR of the small bias space and the noise distribution, again, we have a very nice expression in terms of the Fourier transform. And you know, now we can substitute in uh, these bounds. And if, you, and if the, the bias of the noise is smaller than 1 over the base of the Fourier growth, then we just get the same expression as we had before, just uh, this A times the bias of the Fourier thing. OK, cool. So we see that uh, taking a small bias space, adding some noise, uh, produces a, a pseudorandom distribution for functions with small Fourier growth. Uh, is this useful? Well, sort of, because you know, the problem is that this noise is very high entropy. So how do we actually make use of that? So the intuition, at least that I, I find uh, intuitive, is that the pseudorandom generator is sort of saying, well, OK, I can generate small bias. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to sort of recursively generate something that looks like this noise distribution. It's not going to be exactly this noise distribution, but it's going to be indistinguishable from uh, this noise distribution. I'm going to sort of XOR them like here. Um, now, this intuition doesn't quite match what the generator is doing. And more specifically, the generator says, I'm going to recursively generate a, a shorter pseudorandom string, so maybe 0.99n. And I'm going to sort of pad that using a small bias space, which is similar to, to this XORing process. Yes? You can think of it as slightly differently, saying adding noise is the same as saying with twice the probability that you're going to make the noise, probability 2 beta, you replace the bit with a random bit. So that's like your restriction. So you're saying you think of it as restricting, putting the epsilon biased space in the, in the unrestricted part, mm -hmm. and then you recursively need to find the randomness for the, for the restricted part. So yeah, if you take a, a uniformly random string and just insert some random zeros, you're going to get this sort of noise uh, distribution. And that's basically how the, the pseudorandom generator works. Uh, so uh, here I've presented it as a recursive thing, whereas earlier I was sort of unrolling that as an iter and making it an iterative thing. But this is sort of just trying to give you some intuition for how this Fourier growth bound corresponds to some pseudorandomness property. Some ability to construct pseudorandom generators. All right, so this is, the, this is the theorem that we proved. So as I said, you know, look, if we have this Fourier growth uh, bound, that's going to allow us to do the um, pseudorandom generator. Uh, but there's these other two uh, assumptions here that are kind of annoying. So the close under restriction, that's basically saying when I recurse, I stay within this class. That's all it's, it's needed for. And the fact that it's computed by polynomial with branching programs is uh, to say that I don't need to you know, do this padding thing where I insert random zeros into my string in a truly uniform manner. It suffices for me to do this in a k-wise independent manner. So we do use some property of, uh, of uh, these uh, polynomial with branching programs. Uh, now, where, where does the seed length come from? So each step in this is going to use some logarithmic uh, seed length because you know, we need to sample a small, bi uh, small bias distribution and an almost k-wise independent distribution. Now, now we need to count the number of steps. So each step is going to set a 1 over b fraction of the bits, where b is the base of the Fourier growth. So if you do b steps, you're going to set a constant fraction. So now you need to do that logarithmically many times to set all of the bits. So we get a total number of b times log n steps. So you multiply the number of steps by the amount of uh, seed needed per step, and you get this uh, seed length. So that's some sort of vague intuition for where, where this result comes from. So there's a, there's a point that uh, I, I mentioned earlier, which is uh, so this nice uh, you know, pseudorandomness property that we would like is permutation invariance. So, hmm? Five minutes. 
Okay, great. So this property says, you know, if you've got some output of a pseudorandom generator, x1 through xn, and you permute it, then it should still have the pseudorandomness property. It's like a very obvious property. Obviously, the uniform distribution satisfies this. Uh, but what's sort of distressing is that Nissan's generator does not have this property. So, in fact, you can come up with an example of, I think it's a width 5 branching program uh, with a specific instantiation of the, the hash function being used in Nissan's generator that is able to... To, to distinguish these things. So if you permute it carefully, you actually can break, uh, you can break this. So I think that's uh, it's sort of interesting. And what's really nice about all of these techniques that sort of are based on free analysis, like small bias spaces and Kerr's independent distributions, is that they have this permutation invariance property. If it's Kerr-wise independent, you permute it, it's still Kerr-wise independent. Small bias, you permute it, it's still small bias. So, you know, this generator is a, has this permutation invariance property. So this means that our pseudorandom generator works not just for ordered branching programs, but for unordered branching programs. And in fact, the results that I mentioned for permutation branching programs and with three branching programs, they give the best C length if you're looking at the unordered setting. In particular, we're going to get sort of a poly logarithmic C length, so log squared for the permutation case and log cubed for the uh, with three case, and that's an improvement over you know, n, you know, square root n, which is the best known previous result. Right, so let's uh, summarize. So I, I sort of told you initially about Nissan's generator, which gives you this log squared seed length. It's a really amazing result, really powerful, but it's sort of you know, we need some, some new techniques. Our toolkit is, you know, we need some more things to put in there. And sort of I sort of showed you that we can use some tools from Fourier analysis, bring them over to, to work for uh, small space distinguishers. Uh, in particular, the result that I showed you is that if we have for, bounds on the free growth of a function, we're going to get pseudo random generators. And sort of one nice property of this that I do want to highlight is that these are order oblivious, which means that you avoid this, this weakness of Nissan's generator, which is that it breaks if you permute the, the, the bits. All right, so, so further work. So obviously we'd like to prove Fourier growth bounds for other classes. Um, get better seed length than, than what I showed you. So there's, there should definitely be room to shave at least one log off this, these results. Um, and of course, other techniques and sort of random generators. There's you know, lots, lots of things we want to import. Um, and one particular conjecture that I want to leave you with is that if you have with uh, with W branching programs, we should basically be able to extend this bound to get sort of a, a log to the W minus two base on the Fourier growth. And there's a couple of reasons we believe this. One, it's true for W equals two, W equals three. And also in general for k equals one, we know it's true for uh, special cases. So if you're, if you've got a branching program that computes an AC zero read once formula, or uh, that computes a, it's a regular uh, branching program, then this holds. And those are sort of like the two most important classes of examples. Um, and we also have some like results that are suggestive that this is a limitation on the power. So that's one specific conjecture that we could. Uh, Hmm? What would it, uh, it would imply polylogarithmic seed length for unordered branching programs of constant width. So width w would have seed length log to the w. Could it be better than this? Like, do we, what's the worst example we know of b? Uh, you, so if you use like the recursive tribes function, this is basically tied. Um, so for width 3, the tribes function is tied, and then you can sort of so an and or tree carefully balanced makes this tight. But again, we know that this is true for uh, you know, read once formulas. So like that class, so we know that the, the upper bound also holds for that class. So anyway, thank you. Questions? Yes? So just the uh, intuition for why this is um, permutation invariant. Is just because the Fourier transform is just some of these symmetrical? I guess more importantly that uh, 
shuffling Fourier coefficients around the same degree monomials. Right. Yeah. So like this, you know, this Fourier, um, what's it, sorry, the the Fourier uh, growth. It's just it's a, you know, order invariant. It doesn't matter. Like all of the all of the techniques just don't care if you permute the bits. Yes. Do you think you could bound the Fourier growth for AC zero mod two functions? Um, that's a good question. I don't know. I, mean, I, I feel like you should be able to. Verity is. I mean, my conjecture would would imply this. So the the width of you. Yeah, because we know AC zero mod two is computable in. But read once. Read once. Read once. Read once. Read yes. Yes. Yeah. So okay. Just asking for general. Right? Yeah, I was actually being a little bit greedy asking mm -hmm. for general. Things. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So I mean, <laughs> I, I would suspect it also works for a general, but um, I mean, we know that it works for a general AC zero, but I don't immediately see why it would fail for AC zero mod two. But even if we prove those bounds, it would, your generator wouldn't necessarily so work. So it doesn't have a read one. It doesn't have right. a Yeah. So that's so one of the big. Be interesting in it. Right. What is yes. the simplest example of a function you have like without computational restrictions for which this fails? Majority function is. Majority. Uh, uh, actually, for that, uh, that function, you can put a. Uh, so uh, if you put a equals poly n, if you're allowed to make mm -hmm. a being n to the 4, what's the worst b that can be there for any function? Root n. So uh, which for- Which function will that? That's type for majority. No, for a majority, uh, if you put a already equal to poly n. But a doesn't really help you once you get up to log, you know, k being logarithmic. It's it takes some bent function, right? Like what you would say. Is what I'm saying is a. If you put a allow, if you make a, if you uh, allow a to be very large. I don't think a really you know. helps you that much because you know once you bring k up to logarithmic, it does, you know, like the a is sort of. So how much of the mass of the majority function? The what's the L1 mass of the majority? Uh, oh. Are the same. Oh, I'll just put out. The L2 coefficients are like one in. I mean, the L2 mass is 1, and so if the coefficients are all about the same, then they're about 1 in square root 2 to the n, but there are 2 to the n of them, and so the sum of the L1 Fourier coefficients could be as much as 2 to the n over 2. But, but, but it's not a problem for this thing. The uh, bend function is okay here, right, because you have... Right, because... because you have the n choose k. Right. 2 to the n over 2, and that's... Yeah. So, and the result that I, I showed does get you about uh, square root n seed length for you know, majority classes like that. So it's not completely doomed, but you're not going to get quite a lot of it. Let's take one more question from Luca. Do you need uh, the free growth property to hold for every k up to n, or is it enough if it's up it, it actually only needs it up to log. Up to log. I mean, the thing is, once you get to log, you can sort of do some bootstrapping, and then it automatically holds for larger values. And that's because of the assumption that it's computed by a polynomial with the branching program. All right, let's break for lunch and thank the speakers.